Gary, it is great to see you. It has been a tremendous pleasure to get to know you just a little bit. Uh, we met in New York a few weeks ago, and uh, if someone had told me 20, 30 years ago that I'd have the opportunity to talk to you, I would have said, uh, you're nuts. That's never going to happen. What an extraordinary thrill. So it's great to see you. Great to be here. I have to ask you, sir, let's talk right off the bat about how you got involved in the world of NFTs, because I cannot imagine in 1970 or 1980 or 2021 that the world of NFTs would have ever entered your mind, especially when it comes to translating Doonesbury to the digital frontier. So how did this happen, sir? Well, uh, the same way it, it happened to everybody uh, after Beeple's um, NFT sale at Christie's for $69 million received uh, uh, global attention. There was, there was suddenly huge interest in, in my community of uh, comic strip artists about the potential of NFTs in, in reaching collectors of, of our art. And um, so, you know, we quickly tried to educate ourselves as to, as to what NFTs were all about and where we might fit in. But the problem that immediately arose and, and dampened everyone's enthusiasm initially was, the, was upon learning that there was a huge carbon uh, footprint represented by um, minting NFTs at the time. And so that uh, the more deeply I read about it, I, I began to, to, to learn about artists who had unwittingly started selling NFTs, but had gotten out of it once they, they learned the, the energy used to mint a single image could could power an average household for two years. So, so that stopped activity, um, at, at least in, in, in my circle, um, uh, pretty much dead in its tracks last year uh, for, for those artists who only wanted in if they could, could proceed uh, responsibly. Um, since then, I'd, I'd heard a lot about various solutions that were in the works, but they've been in the works for some time. And, and I just grew more skeptical um, as, as the months rolled by. And uh, it, was, it was really only when um, Polygon emerged as a viable alternative uh, that I, and, and, and not just Polygon, there were other platforms um, that I started getting uh, reinterested. Um, uh, Polygon, um, and, and here I'm getting into, into uh, uh, an area that obviously I'm, I'm not qualified to really expound upon, but um, as, as I understand, it's a set, side chain to Ethereum. It's a secondary network that sits on top of Ethereum's main blockchain network. And it's, it's faster and it has much lower gas fees to, to mint an NFT. But I think most significantly is they've, they've really made a, a very strong public commitment um, to uh, going carbon neutral sometime this year. Uh, the energy use of mining every NFT is accounted for and, and its uh, environmental impact is offset. The goal is for, the, is for their ecosystem to be uh, the first blockchain that's climate positive. And they've issued a green manifesto, which I, to be honest, is hard for me to parse. But <laughs> it, it's it's a blueprint for offsetting its its carbon footprints, and it's very impressive. and And I think that's given permission for for a lot of artists like myself um, to cautiously proceed. And um, uh, I, I have a, a a fairly long relationship with Heritage Auctions, um, both as a buyer and a seller. Um, that um, uh, created an environment of, uh, of mutual trust, I think, that, that, you know, that we, we had the same goals. We didn't want to get into this unless we could proceed responsibly. And um, that's what uh, uh, I, I believe we're doing. So you got interested, as you said, a year ago, as did other members of the cartoonist community. But at what point did you realize that this was going to be something that you wanted to do, not simply for your own benefit, but for the benefit of, here we are, obviously, I believe this is for Ukrainian relief. So certainly well, there Well, you're right. The, this, the, the developments in the technology coincided, um, those improvements coincided with, with the beginning of the war uh, in Ukraine. So it presented us with a unique opportunity to uh, raise funds to aid uh, internally displaced refugees uh, with a project that would be environmentally responsible. So, so is serendipity that 
uh, not only um, could could this project um, proceed uh, in an environmentally friendly way, but uh, we could we could use this first offering um, in in, a, in a, to cr to create funds for for organizations that desperately need it. Um, the International Medical Corps has been in um, Ukraine uh, since 1999, and um, they have uh, established uh, staging areas. They had doctors in place. They had personnel in place. So they were they were very well equipped to immediately respond to the needs of both uh, displaced, uh, internally displaced refugees. But uh, in addition, they, they are, have a presence in Poland and the other um, nearby countries uh, where they are attending to the medical needs of, of refugees who had to leave Ukraine. So um, uh, I, I, I think that the timing was, was, was perfect to, um, um, you know, to proceed with this experiment. And I, and I say an experiment because um, we don't know yet whether uh, legacy comic strip characters have the same uh, appeal as legacy cartoon and comic book superheroes uh, in a marketplace of young collectors who, who didn't grow up with newspapers. That's an unknown. I mean, we know we have our own collectors of, of, of uh, original art because uh, heritage uh, auction, auctions have, have established that fact. What we don't know is whether they want to wade into the NFT waters. Well, it's interesting, right? Because you and this is something you and I talked about a couple of weeks ago, which is where is the crossover between the Doonesbury reader and the NFT buyer? And it was interesting because obviously a couple of years ago, at Doonesbury at 50 actually was available, was the first time every strip up to that point had been available on USB. It certainly has already transitioned in a great extent into the digital realm. Right. I, I mean, I, I tried to get ahead of that just because I was so fascinated by that world. In, in 1995, uh, we released um, uh, three CD-ROMs. Uh, you remember CD-ROMs? <laughs> yes, I think they came with my uh, America Online. Uh, they were the A-track uh, tapes of the digital world. You know, they, it only lasted for a few years, but we had an election game and we had an archive and we had screensavers. That was in 1995, and then prior to the 96 election, uh, the website went up. So the website's been there for you know 27 or yeah 27 years, and um, and then a couple of years later, uh, we we uh, we put the the whole archive again on a CD uh, called the Bundle Doonesbury, um, and then most recently the uh, the full 50 years on a on a uh, flash drive for Dbury at 50. Has that, does seeing it digitally give you a different perception of or a different relationship with the strip itself? To see it digitally? Yeah, to, to experience it digitally. Certainly drawing it on paper, to see it in newspapers for so many decades, and then to see a transition to the computer screen, to the phone. It, does, it doesn't much affect me because the work I do is still, um, uh, you know, a, a pencil on paper. Right. Um, that's that's never changed in 50 years. I still I still uh, draw the strip in in tight detail on um, a piece of art paper, and I uh, scan it, and it goes to uh, an, an assistant in California who inks it online. I mean, um, on screen, uh, he he's a, a digital whiz. He can do things I can't, and he captures the energy of the pencil line, I think, quite effectively. And then he sends it to um, uh, another friend of mine in, in Connecticut uh, who colors it on screen. So those guys work in the digital world. I still don't, other than, <laughs> other than transmitting it to them. But I guess what I mean is the fact that as these became available as the bundle Doonesbury at Doonesbury at 50 and other iterations digitally on the website, which gives folks a better chance to understand, to comprehend, to absorb decades worth of storytelling and to really understand this as an ongoing narrative rather than a series of daily strips. I sort of wonder what that's done to your relationship with or other folks' relationship with and appreciation for Doonesbury. Well, it's certainly, and you never know whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, but it certainly um, connects you more directly to a critical community if that's desirable. 
um, there's the, the internet is so troll friendly that that you proceed at your own risk. <laughs> but most, for the most part, the people that read the strip online uh, on Go Comics uh, or in the Washington Post um, uh, online, um, they uh, are are comics fans, and they often have interesting things to say. I, I try not to get drawn into it. I did that years ago, back back when uh, AOL had message boards. If you remember that, I um, do indeed. And I found it an enormous time suck and um, a, a really good place to go if you want to have your feelings hurt. So I, I, I pretty much retreated from that after just a few weeks of it um, back in the early '90s, and have not. Uh, you know, as as a rule, I don't interact with with people online. I I think that's a that's a prescription for driving yourself insane. <laughs> and um, but but sometimes people have interesting things to say. We we put them. You know, we encourage people to um, uh, to comment uh, on the website, and uh, it is edited for civility, not for you know. It, it doesn't the, the, work, the, the comments can be both negative and positive, but as long as they're civil. Uh, we have no problem posting them. But um, as far as engaging, that's something that um, I, I just have never found the, the, the time or the emotional bandwidth to, <laughs> to deal with. I, I will tell you this from my 30 years in print journalism and digital journalism, my keychain still says, never read the comments. Never read the comments? Never read the comments. Oh, comments. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I've, uh, that's good advice for pretty much anyone. I carry that advice in my pocket everywhere, every single day. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny though, because I sat down the other day for the first time in a very long time to read Doonesbury chronologically. Um, and I had the, the Doonesbury 40th anniversary, this, the, the, the hardback collection, uh, which is one of the, my the, favorites. The 10 pounder. The ten pounder, yes. I, yeah, I you, take need, it on, you need I love someone it. to spot you just to pick it up. And I like to take it on long plane trips. It really <laughs> is a. It's not at all cumbersome for traveling. But what I sat there and I realized how much, how many of these strips that I have read my entire life, and how I had sort of forgotten, and was reminded of how much I loved all of these characters and how glad I was to be back in their company. For this particular project, you chose the strips that you chose for the for the Washington Post 50th anniversary collection, among the other 17 items in this NFT collection. And I want to go back to that decision as you began to pare down those 10 particular strips. And obviously, there are descriptions with each one and explanations for the backstory behind each particular strip. But I cannot imagine, after having gone through 40 years of Doonesbury, that it was at all a simple task to try to under, to try to distill what you were saying, what you accomplished, and what you have really generated in terms of an ongoing, extraordinary narrative to these ten strips. So, how did that process take place? Well, there were there were ones that didn't require a great deal of thought, like guilty, guilty, <laughs> guilty. Ones that simply um, were high impact and were written about and it, uh, to some degree were, were controversial. That was one that the Washington Post famously uh, edited out. Right, um, because you had you had uh, basically proclaimed uh, the... Water yes, Mark, Mark the character, says says out loud uh, what everybody else was saying. I don't think that strip would cause a ripple today because everybody <laughs> says out loud whatever they feel like online. Uh, there, 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 are no, there's, there are no filters, no barriers anymore. But at the time, that was considered prejudgment, albeit the prejudgment of a fictional character. <laughs> and that all by itself was, was considered unacceptable to certain editors at the time. But, but others of, the, of, the, of what we're calling the classic strips um, simply were ones that um, over time, I came to see that people really appreciated. They would they would come up in conversation or book signings, um, and then in addition to that, just ones I'm I'm, I'm most proud of uh, that I think were the most original or kind of groundbreaking for the characters, um, and that, that that pushed the envelope a little. So it, it was a very subjective process. I could come up with several more collections of ten, um, but um, I, I thought that was a representative group. You know, it's interesting because I think about uh, 
if someone had asked me the, the 10 that I would have chosen just in terms of impact. And they uh, wouldn't have included any of those? <laughs> no, I, it, certainly the, the, the BD losing his leg certainly yeah. would have been high amongst there. It may have been a couple of more of the earlier ones. Uh, it feels like a lot of these are, sim are, are I don't want to say that they're later ones, but the Texas sonogram bill. Living well, that's the most recent, and that was 2013. So, right. um, you know, it, it, it must, they're mostly chosen from the first 30 years. Right. It's interesting because obviously there's also one in there that was probably the most impactful. You know, having spent a lot of time as a columnist, you certainly delude yourself into thinking that, by yeah. gosh, I'm going to make a big difference. But as a columnist, you never tend to make a difference. Um, certainly as a satirist, that's certainly your hope and intent. It's not well. a way that is, that is easy to, to measure, for sure. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the best you have is influence. It's funny that people consider people in the media powerful. I mean, I, they don't have any power, but they, but they, <laughs> that's why we're in media, but they can, but they can influence, influence the conversation and um, um, move people to, to thought and judgment uh, if, if you're particularly down on it <laughs> about, about things they hadn't thought of before. Um, but uh, for the most part, uh, it's thankless if that's, what you're, if that's what you're looking for. Now, I never went into cartooning uh, to, to affect uh, uh, social change. Um, and I never really perceived myself as a social justice warrior. I was mostly uh, just kind of reporting, uh, initially reporting on my friends and the world, this very small uh, collegiate world bubble that I'd lived in uh, because I started right out of college and then expanded beyond that as, as I made my own way out into the world. The strip is very character driven. It's, it's odd that it is perceived as a political project in so many quarters because that's probably only, I would say, uh, 10 or 15 percent of, of, of what I've done through the decades. Um, in recent years, uh, uh, yes, the focus has been mostly political because I only get one shot a week and it's very difficult to, to advance the characters and move their storylines forward um, when you only have, have one strip a week to do it in. Um, in addition to that, we live in an extraordinary times uh, politically and um, it, it seems like that's, that's a conversation that I, I guess I still want to be in. Um, but but I think, you know, I don't know if this will show up in the final screen, but you and I are surrounded by characters for a reason, uh, which is that those characters um, were the meat and potatoes of the strip and they're why people care about the strip um, to the degree they do. Um, it's because they, they identify with certain characters. And it is astonishing to me that, that decades later, people will say, I remember that strip. Well, how could they have remembered a strip that took them 10 seconds to read 30 years earlier? That, that astonishes me. But if, if, it, if it triggers something in a, in a, in a person um, and has some particular meaning in their life, it sticks. There is obviously one strip in this collection that did have a significant impact the creation of the Doonesbury Bill, as a matter of fact, the Palm Beach Pass uh, law that is actually uh, one of the NFTs that's there. Right. So I'm curious when you do find that this political moment, um, that this thing you drew actually causes a law to be enacted to protect the people that you were defending in that strip, what that's like for you. Yeah, the, the, the strip about the past laws, um, I, I think, was sort of sui generis. It, 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 it had a, a, an actual um, impact on, on the law in Florida uh, that certainly couldn't have been um, uh, anticipated. I think it was painless politically for everybody. It was, it was during the period of time when there was a lot of focus on apartheid in, in South Africa and for Palm Beach to require identity cards. Uh, for employees to cross the island over into the enclaves of, of, of the wealthy uh, struck us as, as un-American. And um, I, 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 don't, I don't imagine that too many people voted against it. Uh, it. It wasn't a divisive issue. It was just this, this leftover um, injustice that had, had been permitted to remain in place and nobody had done anything about it. You know, it's interesting. You talk about the fact that very little percentage-wise of the strip for the last 50 years has been political. 
And that that once a week, the Sunday strip now has sort of tended to lean it in that direction. Sure. You know, it's funny, I, I've gone back in the last few months and kind of read different critical discussions about Doonesbury, your own thoughts and writings about it outside of the strip itself. And it is fascinating to me, the myriad interpretations that folks have brought to it over the years, as satirical as political, I think Rolling Stone referred to it as your, uh, as your war and peace. Um, <laughs> it, it is to me so utterly fascinating how something, and I assume that this is the result of the personal being the universal, because the strip has been and began as something so extraordinarily personal to you when you're in college, and then to have UPS pick it up, and then to have it become something so successful so relatively quickly and so impactful so relatively quickly, that when something takes a life of its own to the point where in 1975 you win the Pulitzer Prize for editorial cartooning, that I always have sort of wondered, as it took on this extraordinary life of its own, did you ever worry about where you kept, or how people would interpret you, your intentions, your ambitions, and your expressions in this extraordinary tapestry of a, of a cartoon strip? Well, um, that, that question arose early, and I remember uh, reading um, uh, an article about BD's uh, time in Vietnam in, in 72. And uh, the, the person who wrote the essay um, was parsing it for religious references. And um, I, I can't remember the exact details, but he was looking at it through a lens that, uh, that had nothing to do with my original intentions. And I mentioned this to a, to a, a, a professor at, uh, um, when I was still in, in grad school, and he said, well, my dear boy, that's called criticism. It's called literary criticism. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's right. The, the world gets to bring its own interpretations to whatever you do. And, um, you know, you may smile at it because you think it's off base, but but um, that's, that's, that's part of what makes culture go around. And um, shortly thereafter, um, I, I spent maybe way too much time uh, defending the strip um, in the media. You know, it would get bumped out of one paper and then a <laughs> reporter would call and I would respond to the reporter. And, and the, the client list grew and there was no reason to, to differentiate between one client after an, over another. And it just became much too much of a preoccupation. And, and I started to become self-conscious about what I was doing and what I was writing and how I would defend it. And I, so I stepped back from it. I stepped back from um, doing uh, any media for almost 20 years, um, just to kind of spare myself the aggravation and, and keep my eye on the ball and, 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 and just keep moving forward and, and not getting too uh, wrapped up on, in how I was being perceived. I mean, it doesn't mean I wasn't curious as to how I was being perceived and I would, I would read the articles if they were sent to me, but, but it, it seemed to, it seemed to help preserve my sanity. Uh, the deadlines are just relentless. And the one thing that one can never know is as you proceed in a profession like this is whether you're temperamentally um, built for uh, that kind of relentless pressure. It's, it's, I, I've often likened it to being a, a human a public utility. Um, you, you're responsible for content 365 days a year without fail. Uh, this was before uh, some of my colleagues had burned out and my syndicate had, had, man, had, had made um, occasional vacations possible. And um, it's, it's, it's pretty rough on family life. Um, it's, it's, it's not, you know, there's no other profession I would prefer to have been in, um, but I didn't realize that there was going to be a certain sturdiness required. Right. Um, you know, it just seemed like, well, drawing cartoons, how, you know, how, how hard can that be? But, you know, after you burn through your first six weeks of brilliant strips and you have to create another six weeks and then another six weeks. And in my case, it was just week after week because I got so close to deadline. Um, so um, I think it was, it was the right decision for me in those early years uh, so that I wasn't, I wasn't always distracted by, by uh, defending what I was doing. 
Well, you know, it's funny. I, I know that people have often referred to you as the J.D. Salinger of cartooning in as much as you don't do a lot of interviews. But it's funny, you, you, know, you, have, you have struck me as nothing if not approachable and amiable, and certainly <laughs> someone who likes to actually talk about the work. But it's interesting to hear you talk about having to defend it. You know, it is an ongoing narrative. So yeah. when yeah. one drops in and one drops out, to me, I've never thought of these as anything other than people I just like spending a lot of time with. Well, you know, for the first 10 years, especially, and but also the subsequent decade, um, you know, I, I did feel like I was, I was kind of in a defensive crouch because the strip was, was perceived um, you know, for the particular playground that I had chosen, it was it was perceived as being pretty transgressive. And, you know, I immediately started writing about the things that that concerned me as a uh, as a college student uh, in the late 60s, uh, sex, drugs, rock and roll, politics, all that all that good stuff. I thought, well, there's no reason why I can't bring that to the comics page. Well, uh, there was a good reason, uh, or at least there was a very big reason, which was which was it violated. Uh, a, a lot of traditions um, that the comics were, you know, considered a, a safe place for children. And of course, the argument I always made to editors was that, trust me, children aren't reading Doonesbury. They don't understand <laughs> it. It's not funny to them. They think it's dumb. And uh, when I when I talk to, to lifelong readers, they say, oh, yeah, I started around 11 or 12 or 13, about that age when you kind of want your kids talking to you about the subjects that were being raised in the strip. I can very definitely tell you that I started reading it when I was 10 years old. Yeah. Um, and I was immediately drawn to Duke, but I think that has to do with my journalism, <laughs> my, my journalism and my love for Hunter Thompson and the fact that I knew that it pissed off Hunter Thompson so profoundly. Yeah, well, uh, you know, that was, uh, it certainly wasn't my intention to piss him off, but uh, I think, I think you know, he, he probably regarded it as, as a mixed blessing. I mean, on the one hand, <laughs> It helped his brand, and on the other hand, it 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 it, it was a distraction to him, um, you know. That, but but it, uh, the Duke character, you have to remember, it was a parody. He made himself a public figure, right? And um, and I was simply responding to it initially in the initial creation of the character. He's always struck me actually as the least interesting character in the strip because he's so unnuanced. He has this. Um, you know, in, in, in kind of presaging uh, Donald Trump, he, he's, he's very binary. In, in, in faced with any situation, he asks, is, is this in my self-interest or isn't it? And, and it's, he's, he's not more complicated than that. And, and most of the other characters are. Um. <laughs> Look, and I, I want to get back to the NFTs in as much as that. I think that's what I think I love about this collection the most. And when I initially saw these strips having been chosen, because I saw that piece when it ran in the Washington Post, that my favorite pieces in here uh, are really the character pieces, the small, quiet, lovely moments. And I think that, to me, has always defined Doonesbury. And that, again, that's a personal thing. That's, that's the critical theory part of this, that what appealed to me wasn't the political, um, although it certainly kept me reading it. But what, I don't want to say it kept me reading it, it, it I, it, it kept it, I guess, front and center in a lot of people's attention. But to me, it was really kind of these beautiful, simple, quiet moments, of which there are several in this NFT collection. Well, I think for 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 some people, they're too quiet. Um, you know, I've 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 never really um, drawn a, a traditional strip in the sense of setup and gag um, and punchline. Um, it, it's always as if you're dipping into a conversation. And that, that's the, the vibe I was going for. I was very influenced by, um, by Robert Altman in terms of the, uh, my comedy, um, that, that it's all character driven and the comedy comes because of who's, who's talking and their timing and, and when they say what they say. It's, it's, it's not set, it doesn't, it's not, it, doesn't, it doesn't have any of the mechanics of traditional joke setup. Uh, you know, there are occasional exceptions to that, but but mostly it's as if you're leaning into a conversation and you're hearing um, two human beings being very human. And um, you'll notice in many of the strips, there's always, there, there'll be a coda. After the, the, the final line, there'll be another line that just kind of says, and the conversation continues. Um, it, it's... it's uh, 
I, I couldn't write a joke if my life depended on it. <laughs> Which is an odd thing, I guess, for a comic strip uh, creator to say, but, um, uh, you know, that's that's my recipe, and, and some people dig it. Others uh, kind of wish it was something else. Well, for a guy who can't write jokes, it's a damned funny strip. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, that's why, that, to me, you know, that's kind of one of the interesting things about this. You know, there are, you know, the quietest moment in, in this collection, you know, two characters in bed is one of the probably the most controversial strips in the collection. Right. And as much as I think, what, 65 papers didn't run it? Is that? Right. And then one of them who did uh, actually uh, did not run the final um, panel. Right. They removed Joni and Rick and, 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 and instead put the weather for the day, right. which, which it takes some wit. But I, I, I mean, why frustrate your readers like that? I mean, why run the week if, you're, if that's how you're going to resolve it? Um, actually, the four days that preceded it also had no dialogue. Right. And, and you're right. Sometimes not saying anything can be the, can be the, you know, the most uh, compelling thing you can do. And um, I don't know. I don't know how or why it occurred to me to turn off the mic and not have any dialogue and not have any spoken words all those days. But um, it's, it's amazing how anything like that could make people angry, but it did. You know, it's, it's very funny to me when I, when I see them in bed, I just think, I mean, and, and again, it goes back to any of the strips, whether it's um, the sonogram law strip, or, or any of the ones that might have been controversial at the time they ran, at this particular moment, nothing is controversial because everything is accepted, uh, for better or for worse. Yeah. Certainly, nobody has done a better job of documenting that as you yeah, have. Yeah, we're all, we're all transgressive now. Right. And I, I sort of wonder, is does that make it more difficult to do what you do, given the fact that you have always been incredibly thoughtful? You know, I think someone once told you, it, it's certainly not a, a new piece of advice that you can do anything you want. You can tackle anything you want as long as you do it thoughtfully, tastefully, and carefully. Right. But if you, you know. Yeah, if you take we, it seriously, take writing humor seriously. Right, but we live in a wild. It can be very serious. But how difficult is it to do Doonesbury in a wildly reckless and irresponsible age? I don't know. I, that's That doesn't concern. I, I don't feel I had to adjust to that um, so much as I have the, um, the, the, the tremendous amount of, uh, of competition. Um, when I first started, there were relatively few voices that were practicing uh, political satire on a day in and day out basis. Late night comedy was fairly toothless. Oh. And uh, until Saturday Night Live came along in 1976, I think it was, um, they're really, uh, and the Smothers Brothers was, was, was doing pretty good topical humor. But, but uh, now it's all over the place. And uh, there are many shows uh, on TV, and there's so much content uh, on, online and in, in periodicals. Um, uh, I, I think it's impossible for one voice to be influential in a way that it, that it once, once was. I mean, that goes for, uh, for, for people in your profession as well, for columnists. Um, um, you know, there, there, there used to be a time when... Um, columnists uh, for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the bigger papers um, had great stature. And um, now it's kind of free for all. And everybody's on Twitter uh, trying to get everybody else's attention for a fraction of a second. And, um, you know, I, in, in balance, I'm all for the democratization of the arts and uh, of journalism and um, some really good things have come from it, some wonderful voices. Um, but it, there is a cacophony. Um, and we're not all on the same page anymore because because we're not getting our information from the same places. And it, it makes us more unruly as a culture and as a body politic. Um, but um, I, I, I don't see how I, I adapt to that. Uh, I, I just keep doing what I'm doing. Right. I would assume you don't adapt. That, that, no. But it's funny. You, you go back and look at some of the things that caused a stir, some of these strips that are in this NFT collection. And you can just look back at now and think about the controversy that they, they once generated and think, yeah. well, that was, that was quaint. Yeah, it does, does seem a little quaint. Um, so we tried to provide, a, 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 or you know, when I was put, picking those 10 strips, I say we actually, it was just me. I, uh, the editor at the Post let me just pick them myself. 
um, I, I, uh, you know, I tried to, to, to make a, a balanced collection, sort of something for everybody. Right. You think about the sonogram law strip, uh, and now think about the, uh, the, the decision coming down any moment versus involving yeah. Roe v. Wade and think, yeah. gosh, you, to go back to that particular moment and think about the controversy that raised and now the, the moment in which we find ourselves. And that's sort of one of the interesting things about this collection uh, and Doonesbury at 50 and, 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 and the bundle Doonesbury and, and sort of all the things that, that one has been able to read over the years in any iteration is sort of how everything that you have chronicled uh, from the personal uh, has, you know, and, and the political being part of that personal conversation and journey uh, has got us to this particular moment. You know, you're you're somebody who chronicled Trump well before anybody who portrayed George Bush in the most oh, thoughtful and hilarious way one could. But Trump, seen. I mean, it would have been it would have been, you know, cartoon malpractice to 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 ignore him when he was, uh, you know, I was living in New York at the time, and and. Um, it's 1988 when I first started writing about him. Oh my God, what a long, strange trip that's been. <laughs> um, <laughs> at first, he he um, he pretended that he enjoyed it. You know that it was uh, a marker of, of 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 status that he'd made it into the comic strip. But it didn't take him long to turn on me. Um, he has showered me with insults over the years. Well, it's like Henry Kissinger once said, the only thing worse than being in Doonesbury is not being in Doonesbury. <laughs> Which uh, I, I can only imagine what it feels to hear something like that from all the people you've written about. It's funny. I went back through something recently and read uh, a list of all the people that you had managed to piss off. And it's a, a much shorter list than all those you have managed to please Yet at the same time, it's a pretty <laughs> well, powerful list of people. Yeah, um, you know, editorial cartoonists generally, or if I can include myself in their number, um, they're not in the business to please people. I mean, they That's want right. to piss off people. But what's so interesting is that if you do it just right, if it's not too sharp, they want to put it on their walls. <laughs> and and uh, a lot of editorial cartoonists, you know, take that as a, as, as a badge of distinction. I chose to look at it the from a different perspective. And it's that after around 1975, none of them asked me for originals anymore. And I thought, okay, I'm finally doing my job. <laughs> <laughs> I like to hear that. <laughs> Look, I, I, I think this collection is beautiful. It's funny. I, I have gone and looked at them, the, the, the NFTs, the, uh, I love the character map. And it's funny. I, when you put that together and there is something similar for the 40th anniversary the, in that 40th book for the 50th, to, to put together the character map as this universe grew. Were you surprised by, or was it difficult for you to sort of connect those dots? Because this has been a really sprawling tapestry of narrative. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I have to, to, to confess that, that uh, I didn't connect those little tiny dots you can see um, going from one character to the next. Uh, I have a, an associate named David Stanford, who was my original editor at Holt Reinhardt. And he and I have worked together uh, for almost 45 years, I, I would say. And he is the institutional memory of the strip. I can't necessarily put all those dots together on my own. <laughs> Uh, and and sometimes to my great embarrassment is is I'll I'll have two characters meet or you know overlap in some way, in a way that I think is novel, and they say no, they've already met. The readers will <laughs> readers will write in and tell you where you get things wrong, and um, you know if one character mis misspeaks about another character, say no 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 that's that's not how it happened. So um, David is, is, is in charge of making sure that doesn't happen too often. And, and he knows all those relationships. And um, it, it's not on the screen that, that we're on right now, but if over on the far left side, there is a, um, a, a box that contains text that connects all the characters. It's all one long sentence. I can't imagine how long it took him to write that sentence. So and so met someone who was the roommate of so and so who dated so and so, and and he actually was able to connect all seventy three characters in one sentence. I remember reading that character uh, that that sentence for the first time and being utterly wowed, amazed, blown away, <laughs> breathless by it. 
<laughs> that is an impressive piece of writing. I will say that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't want to take credit for it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you know, I know you've talked about doing this for as long as you possibly can do it. I, I just imagine that when these characters, these 73 characters become such an extraordinarily significant part of your life, certainly at some point, I assume they began as, um, just different iterations of you and the things you wanted to say. But as with any character, they take on lives of their own. And I sort of wonder, as we begin to wrap things up here, what that was like for you when you realized that these were going to be people you lived with for a very, very long time and who were going to manifest them in way, manifest themselves in ways that might have even surprised you. Well... I, I, get, I guess I, you know, I was wasn't looking that that far over the horizon um, to think about my relationship to the characters. First of all, it is only a professional one. I never think about them when I'm not writing the strip. Um, you know, they have to be uh, summoned to work, and then I'll cast whatever my you know whatever my theme of the week is. I'll I'll find the right characters that work for that, or create new ones if necessary. Right, <laughs> and. Uh, I think the thing that I've taken the most delight in is, is, in, is in creating successive generations. Um, the characters I'm most interested in, like, like Alex and Toggle and, and some of, some of the, uh, the Gen X characters and millennials, um, is that they're still in the act of, of, of becoming. They're still emerging. And it's when... Um, people are at their most dynamic in their late teens and their early and their mid twenties, and that's just inherently more interesting because you can take them in any direction at that point. Um, you know, I saw with my own kids; they're very comfortable with switchbacks in their careers, and and as they move through life, they're going in all kinds of of of, of uh, directions you wouldn't expect them to. And I've tried to let my characters sort of reflect that um, in their own journeys. And, you know, I always look forward to the next generation. And um, Alex now has her own children, and they're right. now um, three, five, and seven. I kind of lose track. I, um, and, and, and some characters uh, age a little better than others. Um, some have more white hair. I mean, Zonker, I already made a, a decision, a creative decision, that Zonker would never change. <laughs> he will always look, you know, like he looks now. Right. And, and um, that, that, you know, he has so many other Peter Pan qualities. Why age him? You know, might, you might as well just let him be forever young. You know, that, 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 that Bob Dylan ideal. Let's just let him be forever young. Right. Uh, the others, you know, Mike's getting white hair. Mark's hair is all white. Um, BD's is starting to turn. So uh, I move some of them through time. Some of them age more gracefully than others. Um, I, don't look to Doonesbury for consistency. Um, <laughs> it's just, you're not going to find it. Well, you know, miserable. at least they age, you know. Yeah, some of them. But it's funny. I want to ask you this one last thing, because you and I talked about this uh, sort of a little bit at the beginning of this, but we, we spoke about this a few weeks ago. And I think it brings us to the moment you just talked about now about the characters that interest you the most, which are the younger characters, those who are in some ways just beginning to define themselves as you define them. As the father of an 18-year-old myself, it's something I think about all the time. When we talk about who's reading Doonesbury in the age of the declining newspaper readership and the declining newspaper itself, we talk about who that reader is. When you introduce the strip, or when younger readers who might not necessarily be as versed in it as those of us who have been reading it for all, all of our lives, talk to you about it and ask you what it's about and try to find some way into it. What do you say to them? Well, it, it, it depends on what level you want, you, you want to enter the strip. I mean, it's like opening up a Russian novel, right, in the middle. Right. Um, there's there's this, this huge number of characters. But what I've done in the last seven years or so, ever since I stepped away from the Daily Strip, is I've tried to make them pretty self-contained. In other words, you don't really need to know a lot about, about the characters and their backstory in order to, um, uh, to, you know, to get the sense of, 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 the, of what I'm trying to do in, in, in any given strip. Um, during, the day, during the week, we run what 
what we uh, laughingly call Doonesbury classics. Um, yeah. They're basically reruns, but they are curated. And I'm only picking ones that will be intelligible to a new audience that you don't need to know a lot of backstory. I take out all the ephemeral aspects. I take out the politics for the most part. Um, and, 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 you know, particularly, particularly uh, specific uh, references to a point in time and just try to let the characters be themselves and then hope that over time, a new reader will pick up on, on uh, who those characters are. Uh, there's not much I can do to engineer you know, new entry points for, 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 for new readers. Um, and also to be, to be, to be frank about it, um, uh, I, I don't have any huge expectations that I'm gaining new readers at this, at this late date. Uh, I, I hope I do. Um, but, um, you know, it's, 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 uh, it was kind of the job description to begin with just to kind of track this, this, this particular, this huge generation I was born into and explore, explore what their lives are like as they move through time. Um, and, uh, I, I've always assumed that, that, it, that the strip will mostly appeal, uh, to that original target audience. Yeah, but you know, everybody I've ever introduced it to, my age and younger, always find something of themselves in it. So. Um, oh, good. Yeah. Glad to glad to hear that. <laughs> well, I'm a couple of years younger than you, and I, yeah. uh, like I said, in 1978, when I was 10 years old, I remember finding it and falling in love with it and staying with it ever since. And then to see its influence on everything that I loved afterward was incredibly uh, amazing to me as well being at the University of Texas in Austin, where Burke Breathitt had begun yeah. Blue County. Um, I'm like, I remember seeing that for the first time going, wait, th th so this is not Doonesbury. Um, it was, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, a, you know, we talked earlier about, about impact of the strip, and that's one in, uh, area of impact that I'm more aware of is are people in the, in the comedy business itself. I mean, people like Stephen Colbert and, and, um, uh, some of his some of his contemporaries have told me that it was very influential for them as they were growing up. Um, that that I was kind of giving them permission to say out loud um, <laughs> what, what other people weren't, and um, you know, so that's gratifying to know that that you know it had it had that kind of impact on on people coming up uh, behind me in comedy. I can't imagine Colbert without Doonesbury. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I not to not to blow smoke, but I, I, I there are generations of John Stewart. Um, there are just generations of comedians and actors and writers for whom clearly Doonesbury has served as a as a template. I even think of J Judd Apatow and, and certainly generations of filmmakers as well. Um, I'm thrilled, honored, and delighted that we are part of this NFT uh, auction. I think that. Uh, I hope it does introduce Doonesbury to a new generation. I certainly see no reason why longtime Doonesbury fetishists such as myself would be <laughs> eager to snap this up. Certainly for the cause that it benefits. Uh, I yeah, think it'll be generous of you. I, sh I should mention, since we're 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 parked on their site right now, that that Heritage Auction is um, donating their proceeds as as well as as my employer, uh, Andrews McMill Universal. Um, and uh, for that, we are grateful. Well, I'm, I'm delighted and honored to be part of it, sir. Uh, Gary, I, I, again, a great thrill for me. If you had told me that uh, coming to Heritage Auctions a couple of years ago <laughs> meant that I got to spend time with you, that would have been worth it enough. So oh, thank you, that. Robert. That's, that's very kind of you. And, and uh, I've enjoyed chatting with you. Likewise.